like to welcome everyone here this morning for Sabbath School. It's a delight to see all of you here today. And uh, Happy New Year. We're excited for 2021 to see what the Lord has in mind. Let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful today for your greatness, for your majesty. And we are grateful for the privilege to be able to pause in your presence recognizing how great you are and how little we are. We pray for the Holy Spirit to impress our minds, to empower us with your truth today, that we could stand in this great controversy that's raging across this globe today. Bless us with the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, <clears throat> I would like as we get started this morning to uh, just say thank you to uh, Harvest Time, Pilgrim's Rest up in Tennessee. Uh, to Vance Farrell for the research that he did on the editions of The Great Controversy. Uh, just want to say thank you for the work that he has done and the research that he put in in compiling uh, the history behind the different editions of The Great Controversy. Cody, did you have a comment? I just wanted to say, and, and I want to ask for a special blessing of the Lord for this particular study because this is um, something I've been wanting to look into myself because it comes up often. Um, Paul has brought it up a few times too, the different editions of the great controversy, and a lot of people have muddied the waters and a lot of distractions, and usually they come from the independent side on this issue. And it's very scary, so I just praise the Lord. I, I absolutely praise the Lord that you're doing this study today and that hopefully we can get some clarity on this subject. Yeah, it's, you know, it's fascinating because on the one side, you have self-supporting Seventh-day Adventists who are saying, well, you can't read, uh, especially the 1911 edition of The Great Controversy, uh, you have to read the uh, volume four of the Spirit of Prophecy uh, or the 1884 edition. Some will even go as far as to say you can read the 1888. But usually uh, they stop with the 1884 or the uh, uh, volume four of the Spirit of Prophecy. Uh, so that's on the one side, the, the one extreme, if you will. Well, then you've got the other extreme in Seventh-day Adventism where you have people shredding the magnanimous Great Controversy book and creating a 92-page uh, pamphlet, basically, called The Great Hope. I mean, excuse me, The Great Hope. So you have these attacks from both sides against what Ellen White declared, and we will read it momentarily, the most important book that she said she ever put out was The Great Controversy. So let's take a look at it. Where did it all begin? Well, that's what we're going to look at right now. The background for the extraordinary meeting was the vision God gave to Ellen White Sunday afternoon, March 14, 1858, in Lovett's Grove, Ohio. And of course, that's the place, you know, Lovett's Grove. It's fascinating. It always amazes me. 
when God is about to do something fantastic, he didn't choose uh, Columbus, Ohio. He didn't choose Cleveland, Ohio. He didn't choose Cincinnati. You know, one of these well-known, famous, big places that people in the world, if you say, well, you know, tell me a city in Ohio. Well, it's Cleveland, Columbus, or Cincinnati, maybe Akron. But no, God chooses the out-of-the-way place that nobody's ever heard about before that time or since that time. Love its Grove. <laughs> She and James had met with several scattered groups of Sabbath-keeping Adventists throughout the state. In fact, for two weeks, a brother and sister Tillotson drove their horse-drawn carriage to take the whites to where the various small groups of Sabbath keepers held their meetings in Green, Green Springs, Gilboa, and Lovett's Grove. On Sabbath, March 13, as well as Sunday morning, meetings were held in a schoolhouse just north of Bowling Green, Ohio. Besides the estimated 40 individuals who had accepted the Sabbath in Lovett's Grove, others also were in attendance both days. Sunday afternoon found James and Ellen White back at the same schoolhouse where Elder White conducted the funeral for a young man who had died. Upon completion of the service, Mrs. White stood to offer a few words of encouragement to the mourners. As she talked about the resurrection of Christ coming, the cheering hope of the Christian, she would later recall, my soul triumphed in God. I drank in rich droughts of salvation. Heaven, sweet heaven, was the magnet to draw my soul upward. And I was wrapped in a vision of God's glory. During the two-hour vision, God revealed a number of things to Ellen White, including what we now call the great controversy. That's where it all began, folk, right there. Lovett's Grove, March 14, 1858. Now, what did God reveal in that two-hour vision? Well, in light of what came out of Lovett's Grove, God gave Ellen White a sweeping vision from the time of creation all the way to the end of the millennium. All that time. And God said, now go back and write it out. Now who was he talking to to write out this incredible vision seeing the high points all through history in the great controversy between good and evil. Was this woman a college degree? Was this a PhD? No, she wasn't. Third grade education. Third grade education. Go back and write it out. Although much of what she was shown had been revealed to her ten years earlier, she was now instructed to write it out as the mourners bore the body of the deceased to the graveyard. Ellen White said of those still at the schoolhouse, great solemnity rested upon those who remained. Was the solemnity caused by having seen Mrs. White in vision for two hours? Or because she also told something about what she had just been shown? Unfortunately, one can only speculate since she does not say. Her son, who was not with his parents on this trip, but doubtless heard the story from them, would later write, the large congregation which had more than filled the schoolhouse returned to their home saying, we have seen strange things today. The following day, Monday, the Tillotsons drove James and Ellen to Fremont, Ohio. On Tuesday, the Whites took the train to Jackson, Michigan, about 47 miles east of Battle Creek and the Tillotsons returned to their home. As the Whites traveled on the train, Mrs. White apparently described to her husband what she had been shown two days before. Believing the vision important enough to distribute widely, they made plans for her to write out the great controversy portion of it immediately 
upon their return home to Battle Creek and for James then to publish it. So the part that Ellen White first was going to write about was the part that covered the great controversy. Okay. Paul, go ahead. Uh, Bill, I don't, I don't know if you even want to uh, talk about this and understand this is a very important study, but the reason she only had a third grade education I think is pretty important. Not because she wasn't capable, because the devil tried to kill her right then and there. People need to look into what happened. Oh, absolutely, Paul. I think it's because of this book. Well, you know, Paul, it's fascinating. Just, just in, bre in brief, when Ellen White was struck by that rather large rock when she was a third grader, eight, nine years of age, that almost ended her life. In fact, she was so disfigured by that accident, by that situation, that when her dad, who was, had been gone for several weeks, when he came home, he looked at his little daughter, Ellen, and, and, and then he looked at everybody else and he said, where's Ellen? He didn't recognize his daughter. She was so disfigured. Paul, go ahead. And again, I'm not trying to pull it in this direction, but the fact that the reason she got hit with the rock was a jealous schoolmate because she was excelling in her studies. Yeah. She was tutoring the higher grade kids, everything. And it's just a, a, a schoolmate threw the rock at her, another girl, and crushed her skull basically from her nose up. Yeah. No, Ellen White was a bright young girl and uh, extremely practical, down to earth lady. Okay, well, let, what, what happens now is Ellen and James White are planning to write out this great controversy theme between Christ and his angels. Life sketches, pages 162 and 163. What does it say? Two days afterward, journeying on the cars to Jackson, Michigan, we arranged our plans for writing and publishing immediately on our return home, the book titled, the Great Controversy Between Christ and His Angels and Satan and His Angels, commonly known as Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. I was then as well as usual, but on the arrival of the train at Jackson, we went to Brother Palmer's. We'd been in the house but a short time when as I was conversing with Sister Palmer, you know, what happens? My tongue refused to utter what I wished to say and seemed large and numb. A strange, cold sensation struck my heart, passed over my head, and down my right side. For a time I was insensible, but was aroused by the voice of earnest prayer. I tried to use my left limbs, left arm and limb, but they were perfectly useless. For a short time, I did not expect to live. It was my third shock of paralysis, and although within 50 miles of home, I did not expect to see my children again. I called to mind the triumphant season I had enjoyed at Lovett's Grove and thought it was my last testimony and felt reconciled to die. What's going on here? She's being physically attacked by the devil. Physically attacked. Trying to take her life because of what God has shown her and Ellen and James White's willingness to follow through. The devil tried to kill her before she was to write the great controversy. Now listen to what Ellen White has to say about this book, The Great Controversy. It's in Cole Porter Ministry, page 127, letter 281, 1905. She says, The Great Controversy should be very widely circulated. It contains the story of the past, the present, and the future. 
In its outline of the closing scenes of this earth's history, it bears a powerful testimony in behalf of the truth. I am more anxious to see a wide circulation of this book than for any others I have written. For in the great controversy, the last message of warning to the world is given more distinctly than in any of my other books. So the great controversy book, Ellen White said, this was the most important book that she wrote. And this was the one that we have to get out to people. The book, The Great Controversy, she goes on. Now this she wrote in 1911, after the final production, after the final book, The Great Controversy, was finished in 1911, she said this, The book, The Great Controversy, I appreciate above silver or gold. I greatly desire it shall come before the people. While writing the manuscript of The Great Controversy, I was often conscious of the presence of the angels of God. Many times the scenes about which I was writing were presented to me anew in visions of the night so that they were fresh and vivid in my mind. Now I just want to take a brief note here and we will pick it up in a little while in very specifics. When God told Ellen White, showed her things, did God dictate to her and make Ellen White like a robot and say, okay, Ellen, these are the words you're going to write to describe what I showed you. God didn't do that, did he? God gave her a sweeping vision and said, go back and describe it. Describe what you've seen. See, that's very important. God does not dictate to prophets what they are to write. He gives a vision and says, now go back and describe it in your own words. Cody? In, in other words, and un, unlike the devil would do and try to take total possession of somebody and force their every action to be in accordance with exactly the way he wants it, God acknowledges free will. He acknowledges independent autonomy and each person that's written for the Bible they were God's penmen but not God's pen specifically he didn't take them over and make them write it a certain way he inspired them and then the Holy Spirit guided them on on how they were going to write that mm -hmm. okay excuses excuses since 1858 the devil has worked to eliminate the book, The Great Controversy. At Jackson, he tried a physical attack, but since then, he has worked through men to accomplish the same effect. First one, there would be so many meetings to attend that she would not have time to write the book. That was one thing that came about. Scorn, insults, and false accusations would be poured upon her to force her to give up trying to write the 1884 edition or later enlarge it into the 1888 edition. The book is too long. We want shorter books at the review. Make it shorter, she was told. Because she would not return royalties to the review, that was used as an excuse for not circulating the book. Folk, Ellen White had such a difficult time right around 1888, with the people in charge of the Review and Herald, they would not print the great controversy. Uriah Smith um, and others waited a few years. Finally, Ellen White, in, in frustration, she said, fine, if you won't print my books, I'll go outside. And in 1892, she actually took her masterpiece 
on how to become a child of God, Steps to Christ, and she gave it to uh, Fleming and Revelle to publish the book. So that was a huge problem. Uh, there are other books which would sell better, so we'll leave that one on the publishing house shelves was the policy decided on between 1888 and 1890. Some other people probably wrote the later edition, so have nothing to do with the 1888 or 1911 editions. Now that's what we hear today, don't we? That's what we hear today. The earlier editions are not officially approved today, so do not circulate them. We'll keep the current edition so highly priced you can't afford it. Well, that's going on now. Everything in that book was copied from someone else, so the book is worthless. We hear that. The book could get us in trouble with the Sunday keeping churches, so do not distribute it. We hear that. And of course, because of this, they said, well, fine. We'll just simplify it into the great hoax. That book should never be distributed first, always later, much later. You know, we've, we've got to give them steps to Christ, desire of ages, mount of blessing. Give them great controversy after they've read all these other books. It's too hard a book to sell. The children's books are better. I have the book at home on my bookshelf. No, I'm so busy with other things, I haven't read it for years. But yes, I do think it's very important. See, we've got all these excuses, don't we? All these excuses. And it was the one book, the one book that the devil tried to kill Ellen White so she wouldn't write it. Paul? Another interesting thing. Uh, about her writing the book when she had her stroke, the Lord allowed it because of pride. And in Life Sketches, she talks about the fact that uh, she asked the Lord that if she ever felt proud or haughty that he would bring sickness on her. So it was a combination. And the thing that I got out of that, it was written in great humility. She was very careful to see to it that it was exactly what the Lord wanted. And uh, it, it saved her from being a cripple for the rest of her life writing that book because she had to force herself to write it. But she also saw it as the Lord telling her to be more humble, if you can even imagine Ellen White not being humble. So I found that to be it because the Lord can only allow the, the devil to do things that he allows to his servants. And there's always a reason for it and a blessing for it. And I think she was extra careful to make sure it was exactly what he wanted. Great point, Paul. Great point. Here is a notice of publication that appeared in a June 1858 review article. It says, the great controversy... This is the title of a work now in the press written by Mrs. L Mrs. White. It's a sketch of her views of the great controversy between Christ and his angels and the devil and his angels from the fall of Satan until the controversy shall close at the end of the 1,000 years of Revelation chapter 20. It will contain between two and 300 pages, price neatly bound in muslin, 50 cents. So this was the original book called The Great Controversy, but it encompassed all the way in heaven, all the way through to the end of the millennium. So we're looking, folk, the original book, two to three hundred pages, covers what we have today, patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings, desire of ages, acts of the apostles, and the great controversy itself. The following notice of publication. Uh, okay, that's the same thing. Now, in this book, there were words, there were phrases that Mrs. White wrote. 
she would say things like, I was shown, I saw, are to be found as many times, in fact, as there are pages in the book. That was how Ellen White would describe what she saw. She'd say, I saw this, I was shown this. From creation, the story takes us down through the Old Testament to the life of Christ and the apostles, and then to the apostasy of later ages, the Reformation, and the final crisis. Would people who don't know Ellen White, who are not familiar with her prophetic gift, would they understand that? I was shown. Well, where were you shown that? Who showed it to you? People in the world who are not familiar with her prophetic gift would be confused. So it was determined that there would be updates, there would be changes made in the original volume one of the Spirit of Prophecy. Now let's get in for a moment. As Ellen White is writing this, these books, again, she was shown sweeping visions but she used her own words. From documentary file 83B, Willie White, 1910, he says, Mother has never laid claim to verbal inspiration. And I do not find that my father, Elder Bates, Andrew Smith, or Wagoner put forth this claim. If there was verbal inspiration in writing her manuscripts, why should there be on her part the work of addition or adaptation? It's a fact that mother often takes one of her manuscripts and goes over it thoughtfully, making additions that develop the thought still further. That's Third Selected Messages, page 437. In a few places where ambiguous or misleading terms have been used, Mother has authorized a changed reading, but she protests against any change in the argument or subject matter of the book. And folks, that goes right back to the previous slide. Constantly, Ellen White was saying, I saw, I was shown. But she realized as people talked to her now, Ellen, some people in the world would not understand that when they're reading your books. So we need to change that. And so Ellen White said, fine, let's change it. Let's make it as attractive and as clear to people as possible. So there were things that needed to be changed. There were things that needed to be added or adapted and so that's why from 1858 to 1884, they realized we've got to make some changes here. The I was shown, the I saws, and many other things were changed. Things were added as well. God impresses the mind of the prophet does not impress words. He impresses the mind. The Bible points to God as its author. Talking about the Bible. This is from the intro to the book, The Great Controversy. It says, Yet it was written by human hands, and in the varied style of its different books, it presents the characteristics of the several writers. The truths revealed are all given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16. Yet, they are expressed in the words of men. The finite one by his Holy Spirit has shed light into the minds and hearts of his servants. 
He has given dreams and visions, symbols and figures. And those to whom the truth was thus revealed have themselves embodied the thought in human language. That is why, folk, as you look from the time of 1858 when Ellen White was given her first vision in Lovett's Grove, Ohio, down to even shortly after her death with the completion of the Acts of the Apostles. From that first book of two to three hundred pages, now we have five volumes that are what, over 3,000 pages? Maybe three to 4,000 pages. Why? Because Ellen White saw that things needed to be added. Things needed to be adapted. Things needed to be changed over this process of 50 to 60 years. So the 1884 edition, why did they need that? Well, we just said it, but let's read it here. A letter by James reveals that in mid-January of 1879, Ellen began work on the enlarged Great Controversy. This work was primarily done in two ways. She was shown in brief flashbacks while writing portions of the 1858 vision, which were not as clear in her mind and had therefore not been included in earlier presentation. Number two, she was given additional material in new visions. She was also instructed that as she searched other biographical accounts, especially on the life of Christ, she would recognize worthwhile ways to express her ideas in a fuller, pleasing variety. And as she read through the writings of church historians, she would locate and date scenes she had been shown in vision. This she did. As additional light was given regarding the great controversy, she was instructed she should write it out. This she faithfully did. This is how the 1884 edition came to be. The same procedure produced the 1888 edition. Each one was an enlargement of the one before it. Each one was therefore important. Yet the publication of a new edition did not negate the importance of the previous one. This is very important, very important that we understand. Back in 1980, when I was at PUC, I can still remember there was a man, an Adventist pastor named Walter Ray, that came out with this monster article in the Los Angeles Times. And it said something like, on the front page of the LA Times, Ellen White, a plagiarist. Folk, as Ellen White is trying to explain these incredible scenes that she was shown in vision, she was an avid reader and she went back to different books, Daubigny, Wiley for historical documentation. And then people on the life of Christ like Hannah and others. But as she would read their books, she'd say, that's what I saw. That describes so beautifully what I saw in vision. And she would take what those men had written and she would put it into her book. And she was accused of stealing. It wasn't stealing at all. And in fact, a Catholic lawyer, Vince Ramick, came out in the 1980s after Walter Ray's attacks. And he said Ellen White was well within the legal confines of her time. 
in the borrowing of material that she got from other people. The amazing thing to me, folks, is how Ellen White, how Ellen White knew what to borrow and what to leave alone. That's fascinating to me. Mother has never claimed to be an authority on history. The things which she has written out are descriptions of flashlight pictures and other representations given her regarding the actions of men, the influence of these actions upon the work of God for the salvation of men with views of past, present, and future history in its relation to this work. Now, this is Willie White commenting in 1911. It's also in Third Selected Messages, page 437. In connection with the writing out of these views, she has made use of good and clear historical statements to help make plain to the reader the things which she is endeavoring to present. When I was a boy, Willie White said, I heard mother, I heard her read Daubigny's history of the Reformation to my father. She read to him a large part, if not the whole, of the five volumes. She's read other histories of the Reformation. This has helped her to locate and describe many of the events and movements presented to her in vision. This is somewhat similar to the way in which the study of the Bible helps her to locate and describe the many figurative representations given to her regarding the development of the great controversy in our day between truth and error. Folk, think, just think for just one moment. She is given a panoramic view of 6,000 years of a cosmic war going on in this, in this world. Do you think she didn't feel a little bit helpless? How am I going to explain all of that? How am I going to do it? And God said, Ellen, you go back and you read. You read Daubigny. You read Wiley. You read Hannah. You read Coney Bear and Housen's books on the life of Paul. And you will find gems of truth. You will find history that you can incorporate to explain what I have shown you. Paul, comment? You know, Bill, this is why uh, in the beginning I wanted to, br well, it's not what I want. I just wanted to make the comment about her scholarly mind even when she was in third grade. She, was a, she excelled in reading. She excelled in this type of thing, and she was going to be a, a, a very high-level teacher. That was her aspirations. So she had this quality. She wasn't some dumb bumpkin, and I think that need be understood, but the Lord did not want her in universities. And she got struck with the rock, and all this came out of that. But she was of a scholarly mind, and I think people need to understand that. She wasn't just some illiterate, dopey woman. No, she was tutoring, teaching people to read in the fifth and sixth grades when she was in third grade. She helped the teacher. Yeah. It's amazing. It, it, it truly is. And clearly, clearly, as she's reading these voluminous books, Daubigny, I've read some of Daubigny. My, there's a lot there. A lot there. Wiley's book, Hannah's on the life of Christ. Now, so the 1884 edition comes out because changes needed to be made. It, it was dawning on the brethren that this was to be a book for the world. And so things that were in there that people wouldn't understand, who didn't understand Adventist jargon, needed to be taken out. 
and other material needed to be added to get a broader and clearer picture of what she had seen. That's why the 1884 edition came out. And now we'll find out why there needed to be another one in 1888. Cody? It's funny because what Ellen White did in regards to her vision is she allowed her vision to guide her to the proper historical truths, the, the gems that she found. And we do the same thing. The same exact method of study is what we do. We see things in prophecy. We see concepts like, for instance, the mark of the beast or, or um, the, who the Antichrist power is. And then we look in history for where we can find that information. <laughs> I believe Revelation chapter 18, verse 24 is a perfect example where it says that the blood of all uh, basically can be laid at the feet of the Roman Catholic Church system. Well, that is a, that's a tall check there. That's, that's, that's just a little bit of information that's in there. That means anytime we see a lot of people dying off, that somehow there's a road that leads back to Rome, if you can find it. And you've taken that exact principle, and you've used that in the Behind the Door series, for instance, where you've seen people die on the Titanic, people die in World War I, World War II, Vietnam and some of these other calamities and things that have gone on. And there's a lot of books on that information, but which one follows what God's word says? Those are the gems that you have found and that have been such a blessing to other people. Mrs. White follows the exact same thing here. She lets the vision guide her to the actual specific scholarly you know, dates, times, and events but she allowed the vision of God to guide her. And I love that it's all, it's all evangelism focus. She allowed those words to be taken out like I saw, because how can somebody who has just came out of the Mormon religion, where they have a false prophet, what are they going to think Cody. when they read a couple chapters of I saw and they're going to throw the book away? Of course they are. So, The, the incredible, and Cody, it's a great point you're making. Everything everything that Ellen White wrote, it was in subjection to that vision at Lovett's Grove. Everything was in submission to what God showed her. And she went back, Cody, just like you said. She said, okay, here's my standard. Here's my standard. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to find material that supports what I saw. That's what she did. <laughs> it's incredible. And again, Cody, just like you're saying, Ellen White, she gets this vision. She starts writing it out. Folks, think about, she must have felt overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by this. And so she's trying to get it out and she's saying, I saw this. this, this is what I saw. I was shown this. Okay, great, 1858, 1860, that's the beginning. But then as time goes on, as time goes on, she and others sit back and say, now, are we writing this just for Adventists? So, so the concept of the purpose for the book and the theme, it starts to grow. And they say, no, we didn't just do it for Adventists. We did it for the whole world. And so now they say, okay, what did, what's in that book that maybe worldly people would not understand? So they make changes. They make changes. It's incredible. It's incredible. Now, 1884 to 1888, something very interesting was going on. This was a volume of the Great Controversy, which focused on, primarily focused from the destruction of Jerusalem to the end of the world. 
Okay? 1884 edition. But between 1884 and 1888, something happened. Does anybody know where Ellen White went during that time period? It wasn't for that entire four-year block, but she spent the better part of 1885 through 1887 outside of the United States. Australia? Not Australia. She went to Europe. And what, what happened in Europe that had and would have a huge impact on writing the great controversy from the destruction of Jerusalem to the end of the millennium. Folk, the great controversy had chapters on Huss and Jerome. Where did they live? They lived in Europe, Czechoslovakia. The Walden Seas, where did they live? Lived in Italy, northern Italy. Martin Luther and the Reformation, where did he live? Germany. You have this sweeping movement, folk, of 300 years smack in the heart of the great controversy from Huss and Jerome right around the end of the 14th century all the way down to Wesley into the 18th century. And Ellen White ends up in Europe. <laughs> And there you go. And she starts researching and visiting some of the places. And as she goes through Europe, she says, I saw that place. I was there. And so what do you think Ellen White did from the 1884 to the 1888 edition of the Great Controversy? She expanded the chapters from Huss all the way to Wesley. The chapter on Huss and Jerome in the 1884 edition, it was three pages. Three pages. From the 1884 to the 1880, 1888 edition, that chapter became 23 pages. You see, folk, that's the beauty that is the beauty of these different editions of the great controversy. They only added to the beauty of the book and made it more readily acceptable to people outside of the church. Cody. And I very, very much appreciate those chapters and the expansion of those chapters because I'll tell you, as somebody who was born in 1989, I, I knew nothing at all about the Reformation. Hadn't been taught it in school. <laughs> yeah, I'd heard Martin Luther's name, didn't really know who he was. But I was taught nothing, not even in college. I wasn't taught much there either. Um, but I did have a good teacher. He did explain a couple things. But this, this, this history is lost history. So I'm so grateful for those Amen. chapters, for that large section in the beginning of the great controversy that goes through the Reformation and shows step by step where God is inspiring men to fight against the Antichrist power, which is the Roman Catholic system. And it points out that great controversy step by step. Amen. And I really appreciate that history because we didn't, Amen. I don't have it. Amen, Cody. And Cody, that all, that took place between the 1884 edition, and it was all added to the 1888. Plus, there was some other, more things added to the 1911, which we'll get to. Paul? And you know what's amazing to me, Bill? And this is just a general statement. Whenever they have an issue with Mrs. White or, or something being changed, Willie White is the demon. It bothers me that these people have no conscience whatsoever to slander that man any which way they can. 
he he's he's just he's the devil, Willie White. He really did his mother bad, and that is just they're gonna. I mean, that's horrible. It's always Willie White. Paul, I, I believe we have a, I have a quote in this where Ellen White specifically says, specifically says, the Lord showed me that Willie was to be my helper. I have that in the letter she wrote. Yeah. She phrases it. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. Um, all right, let's see this slide. Interestingly enough, this trip to Europe was very definitely in God's providence. After completing the second 1884 edition of The Great Controversy, there was no plan in Ellen's mind that she would ever again redo all that work and enlarge it a third time. <laughs> but arriving in Europe, she met people, saw places, learned of incidences, which firmly convicted her that even though she had already finished an edition of that book, she must do another one. So a sizable amount of that two-year stay in Europe was spent collecting data for a second revision of the book, part of which was completed while there. In addition, she was shown in vision that the great controversy must be given the widest circulation to those outside the church. You know, we get this idea that, that God wrote, <laughs> that God impressed Ellen White and, and made her his messenger at this time for Seventh-day Adventists. And that's a bunch of hoot. Ellen White is a messenger for this planet. For this planet, folk. She was shown in vision. Okay, let's see. This intensified her conviction to revise the book again. It affected the format of the book. She felt she should use a more literary writing style, provide more detail on historical incidences. Now, that makes such perfect sense for somebody that's a writer. That makes perfect sense. And this, this is, makes such sense, too. And to omit the three-page section in the Snares of Satan chapter, which spoke of Satan's plan to destroy the church. This book, she felt, should be written for the world to read, not just the church. Now, I think I'm going to stop here. But the next time we do this, finish this study, I'm going to read to you the three pages that were taken out of the 1884 edition when the 1888 edition came out. And the reason why? <coughs> These three pages had to do with the devil attacking the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Ellen White looked at it and others and said, this is for the world. Those, those three pages, that's talking about the devil attacking Seventh-day Adventism. That doesn't belong in a book to circulate to the world. So they were removed. And we will take a look at what Ellen White said and it will become very clear as to why it was removed by the 1888 edition. We'll look at that next time, God willing. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you that you used people. Thank you that you used Ellen Harmon White. Thank you that you patiently guided her from Lovett's Grove and that vision to the final 1911 edition of The Great Controversy. 
Thank you for that masterpiece. Thank you for the privilege that we have to have that book in our hands and that we can send it all over this world uh, to fulfill the vision that you gave to your servant a long time ago. We just pray that you'd continue to light flames of fire in our hearts and minds to go and send that book everywhere we can. In Jesus' name, amen.